Hello, I'm Dr. Roger Steiner, Director of the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute and Professor and Chair of Ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine. Welcome to Medscape Ophthalmology Insights, coming from the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting in New Orleans. Joining me today is Dr. Burkhart Dick. Happy to be here. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Uh, Dr. Dick is professor and chairman at the Center for Vision Science, Ruhr University Eye Hospital in Bochum, Germany. We'll be discussing the latest developments in femtosecond lasers for refractive cataract surgery with a particular international perspective. Dr. Dick, you have, if not the largest, probably as close to the largest experience of anybody in the world using the femtosecond laser for cataract surgery. So could you just start now by telling us, since we were here a year ago, how this has changed in your practice patterns and how you view the laser today? Well, it changed a lot. Um, to be honest, um, interestingly, more and more patients are informed about the potential to use the laser in cataract surgery. Uh, I've done now about 2,450 cataract surgeries with lens with laser um, on a commercial base, and um, the laser is placed in the OR. Um, it um, takes me the same time for my cataract surgery as a standard care, but uh, the it's a shifting. The lasing takes about two to two and a half minutes, but this is then cut from the intraocular procedure because the intraocular procedure is then shortened, of course, because everything is done. Now you have the Optometica right. Catalyst platform. Yeah. So are you keeping the patient on the same fixed bed? Yes, and I just do. just swiveling it? Yes, I do. The good thing is that you can just go into the eye first, for example, if there is a small pupil or something like that, and you then go under the laser and do the lasing, and then go back and just take the, uh, the microscope again. So the good thing is you can do anything in this room, and that's, that means the quick procedure then. So from a physical point of view, you can get access to right eyes and left eyes adequately? Right, exactly, yep. Well, no problem. Great, yep. okay. So now tell us a little bit about standard results, and then we, I want to get into some special cases. Well, we conducted prospective randomized intra-individual comparative trials because I'm interested more in the evidence base behind all this. And um, interestingly, it turned out that inflammation was a little bit less, but in the best corrected visual acuity turned out to be, for the first week, uh, better than the standard uh, care. This was uh, one eye standard and the other eye femto uh, cataract surgery in the same patient on the prospective randomized trials. Endothea cellos was comparable, was a little bit less in the Enfemto group, uh, and uh, we found, of course, a tremendous reduction in effective FECO time because of the full fragmentation that the laser offers. It, is, it lasers outside of the capsulotomy from the inferior to the entire part, and um, my, my complication rate, to, to, so to say, is extremely low with this laser. It is on a prospective scale. We are um, video, HD videotaping everything and documenting everything and another um, medical doctor documents everything and we found a 0.16% um, rate of anterior um, as well as posterior capsule tears. So all capsule tears, all front tears. and back, 0.16% yes. yep. 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 So this is quite different than that initial reports with the initial users right. of a different platform right. out of Australia that created right. quite a sensation, as yep. you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do you have special maneuvers that, that you think allow you to not have like gas pressure rupturing the posterior capsules, for example? But these are different lasers, and the different lasers have different approaches. They have different numerical apertures, so they are using different energy, for example, as well as the fragmentation is different. So um, what we found, for example, that uh, we can do a hydrodissection as usual. That means we have, don't have these difficulties with cortex aspiration or something like that. And um, it's all about taking care around it, of course, because, uh, for example, if there is a movement in the patient, my breath or something like that, or move the eye or something like that, uh, you need to take care of the patient. That means, for example, I say to the patient, breath in, stop, like an X-ray, and then I do the lasing, which takes about less than two seconds, and then keeping on. Because the lasing of the capsulotomy is the most critical issue, so to say. The detection of the surfaces is automatically, you can just confirm it, but uh, it's, it's on a 
3D spectral domain OCT, so it's extremely precise. Well, and you, you mentioned about the anterior capsulotomy. As, as you know, there, there's a paper just coming out now showing irregularities right. of the anterior capsulotomy, right. and uh, you just went over a very specific uh, maneuver you do, the, the breath right. holding. And do you think that that actually is what was going on in that paper and why they found irregularities? Yeah, many other f issues, and we just uh, sent a uh, letter to the editor which are you, <laughs> and, um, and addressing many issues. For example, it's a central dimple down technique. That means you go into the eye first with the cannula and dimple down the, at the center of the capsulotomy so that the forces are bent inwards. 99% in my all comers approach, the capsule is already free, free. But sometimes because of corneal scars or something like that, it's not free, it's there are little adhesions, but you can that then, with the central dimple down and the, with this force that's directed inwards, uh, you can take it in so there are no t that to, to reduce the number of texts, for example. So I think these are key features. There are so many things that we share in user meetings, for example, to, exactly to prevent this. Because if you look in experimental trials, they've all shown with the FEMTO treatment that there's even more resistant. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think from my perspective, this is the same as with my manual capsulot capsulorexis. The capsulotomy is the same in terms of resistance. But it's important that to change the technique accordingly. So we, we are just, you know, we learned a lot from analyzing and, and, and seeing and, and teaching. And I think people need to understand what's going So you certainly have not seen any evidence of weakening of the anterior no, capsulotomy? No, definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. Okay. No. Now, one of the other things that's been said at meetings, at least, uh, about femto is that it, the cortical cleanup is more difficult because the little tags of anterior cortex that you want to grab are not there. Have you experienced no, that? No, not at all. As I said, we are doing the hydrodissection and hydrodelineation usually as we, do it, we used to. And the reason is I'm convinced that, um, for example, the... Um, so-called capsular block syndrome that has been first described with another platform is not possible with the Optimedica system. Yeah? And um, 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 the reason is that uh, you have a totally different uh, fragmentation and, um, and we fired into the lens in 14 eyes under a prospective randomized, uh, not randomized, but prospective clinical trial with ethics committee permission. And uh, we didn't do the capsulotomy at all. And interestingly, nothing happened. Yeah. So no capsular tear or something like that, what you would think because of the, all the blowing up the lens and all this stuff, although we were excessively firing into the lens. So I'm convinced that uh, this is not, cannot happen and has not been reported, for example, worldwide by the users and also not um, for me. So I'm convinced that this is something different. And hydrodissection and delineation is done as you're used to and all the surgeons, and we did a trial comparing coaxial um, a standard cataract surgery with femto uh, and, and, and monoaxial as well as biaxial and didn't find a difference mm -hmm. in terms of uh, ease of, of aspiration, time for, for aspiration and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this, uh, maybe there may be differences between the platforms. I see. Yeah. Now, I think I'm hearing at the meetings and, and from you and others that there are some very special indications for using the, the laser where you felt it's really made things better. Yep. Can you yep. go well, into that? Honestly, there are a lot of contraindications currently. If you look at the manuals of the laser platforms, I would say these contraindications are the indication for femtosecond laser. I'm talking about small pupils, for example. We have uh, shown and, and shared the technique, the surgical technique, how to do this. And um, if the lens is already pre-fragmented and you are just aspirating, and in my last 400 cases, I was just only aspirating, no use of ultrasound any longer. And um, in all these eyes, of course, they, the small pupils come with pseudo exfoliation with uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, with many other pathology around it, so they are challenging. And, and especially these eyes benefit most, small pupils, intermestin cataracts, for example. If you go into the eye first, inject, inject some OVD, so there is a clear with um, some resistance in the AC, and then you fire the capsulotomy. It's all about the capsulotomy in these fluid, milky lenses. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's really uh, easy, easier to do these cases. Or, for example, cornea gotata eyes. I, I really f saw the differences if you are only aspirating or using minimal, if at all, ultrasound, uh, that the 
cornea is looking pretty better and, and the clear, uh, clearer on the day of surgery. And for, for example, the pediatrics. The pediatrics, everybody knows how great the elasticity of the capsule bag is and how hard it sometimes it is to prevent an extension of the uh, okay. a capsule. And, and with this, you need a little correction factor. We were working on that because the capsulotomy is a little bit larger than you, um, you fired. It depends on age, obviously, and the elasticity b behind it. But we have done 20 eyes now with great success. But, uh, and, and these eyes are, are really benefiting because you can do the anterior capsulotomy and you align the posterior capsulotomy according to the anterior. And this gives you a loop, options for back in the lens, options, and so forth. So with the white mature lens, for example, it's under pressure. You're, as long as you counteract that with the OVD, right. then you, the time, the one and a half or so seconds yes. for the capsulotomy gets through fast enough that you've never seen an Argentinian flag no, sign? No, 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 no. And there are different approaches. If you see, you can see it on this, because of the high resolution OCT, you see if there is high pressure in the lens. You see these cavitations and the pressure behind, if this is the case. Sometimes you don't see that at the slit limb to that extent, in the Morganian cataract, for example. And in these cases, you, you might uh, um, even go, if you don't have the possibility to go into the eye first, yeah, uh, because the laser is outside or something like that, I pre would prefer to do a small capsulotomy first and then later on redock or do a manual capsulotomy mm -hmm. or, uh, and reshoot and do a rexus shaping or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And for dealing with the small pupils, which you touched on earlier, but didn't really get into the technique, what, what is your preferred technique for the small pupils now? Well, I, I have a strategy. That means I, I start with epinephrine injection. If this doesn't work, I do a viscomide rhizis with high viscous OVDs. And um, you have to increase the treatment zone of the capsulotomy a little bit because uh, um, in, in, in um, it, it, the diagnostic pathway as well as the laser pathway is a little bit changed because the refractive index of the visc uh, the OVD in the AC is, may not be the same as the aqueous mm. humor. So you have a uh, little offset, but you can compensate this by elevating the treatment zone. And you have to elevate also a little bit if you have using OVD and viscomide rises, uh, the, the energy because it's dampened a little bit, decreased, and the effect is decreased by the high viscous OVD. And um, if this doesn't work, because I need 5.5 something, pupil size, mm -hmm. uh, then I inject in my Yugen ring. It's available in different sizes. Or others may use um, iris hook. And um, iris hook was o work also very well with this interface, because you can take the iris hooks inside this um, okay. in, uh, you interface. You anticipated what I was going to ask you. <laughs> yes, uh, what do you do with those hooks? Yeah. But I would, yeah. pr I would prefer and recommend, yeah. um, on a large scale, I would say it's better to have the OVD out for the lasing then. Because uh, the results were, were good, but were even better comparing this on the prospective scale if we took the OVD out. Because of the focusing and the optical yes. breakdown. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Fascinating. So now, I've always felt that you know when we have these arguments about is there really a reason for this? Is this all just industry pushing a laser? That that just as with phaco emulsification, that really only came of age when we had small incision lenses. But we never would have had small incision lenses right. without phaco. That the same was going to eventually play out here, and that yep. the femto would enable us to go to places we can't go right now technologically. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Where do you think this is going to take us? Ooh, <laughs> there are many <laughs> things to explore. One thing one might be a, a femto IOL that's fixated in the where you have the rim in the optic and the anterior, the lens is put into the back, as you are used to, and you are fixating the uh, optic, uh, uh, the, the capsule in the optic. The capsulotomy is done and is centered, and then you, f you have the chance to fixate it. It gives the ad potential advantages are that there is a, 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 a good predictable effective lens position with uh, low changes anterior posteriorly of the, because the, you're not that dependent on capsule back shrinkage. And the back shrinkage would just fixate the lens and um, prevent rotation in toric lenses, mm -hmm. center it, the, the multifocal according to the line of sight or close to, to where you want it to sit, and many other interesting options. So you're a believer in line of sight, centration. Well, I'm using the scan capsule rather than the pupil because I, I don't think the pupil centration, if it's white, 
it doesn't matter. But if it's a little bit smaller, I wouldn't go for uh, pupil centration just for the so-called scan capsule. That means that you take into account the anterior surface curvature, posterior curvature, as well as three-dimensionally analyzed a certain line there. And you can nicely predict the uh, position of the lens uh, preoperatively or interoperatively at that point. Yeah, and I think that's better uh, rather than the pupil centration because sometimes pupil does not dilate well, sometimes it's asymmetric yeah, and, and, and other, other, other issues. Uh, so, so there's a lot of things to improve currently, but we are all already on a very high level where we start with this new technology. Have you heard anyone or had your own thoughts about whether the femto will finally get us to the point where we have a true accommodating intraocular lens and how that would happen, or is that still... That's a very optimistic yeah. approach, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Still, yeah. We all hope. But there's, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things to explore. Currently, I would say, uh, still, we are away, far away from, from a true accommodating IOL. Well, we can always hope we're going to yes. get there. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. Well, I'd certainly like to thank you for joining us. My and pleasure. Uh, thank you, the audience, for spending this time with us. Uh, I'm Dr. Roger Steiner with uh, Dr. Burkhardt Dick and for Medscape Ophthalmology from AAO 2013.